Hi. I'm Laura. And um, I'm going to talk about memoir today. I took a sabbatical in fall of 2021 uh, in order to write a memoir and also to kind of think about memoir as a genre of literature. And it's not exactly that it wasn't considered that or it isn't considered that, but it's often not taught that way. It's often not taught in the same way as a literary text. So some of the things that kept coming up for me while I was reading and writing my own memoir were questions that seemed really relevant to the time, which were questions about what is true and what is fiction. And when we're reading these texts that claim to be nonfiction or claim to be truth, what are the writers really asking us to consider? And so that's what my talk today is about. And the first, um, the, the first line there of the title, is from this poem by Emily Dickinson, a traditional literary text. Everyone would consider this to be literature, right? Um, and it's a poem called Tell All the Truth But Tell It Slant. And there it is. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant, success and circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. So I named this lecture after this classic literary text about truth telling because it asks some of the same questions that I think memoir asks. And I also think that it goes through a similar process to what a lot of memoir writers are going through when they are trying to present their own stories. So this is kind of um, Emily Dickinson's philosophy of the truth, right? Written in poem form. So she starts out with a paradox, which is that we want to tell the truth, but it's hard to tell the truth directly. And sometimes there is a bad reaction when we tell the truth directly. And so success, whatever that means, success for the poet, success for the storyteller or the truth teller, lie in circuit lies. So lies in kind of indirectness or not entirely telling the truth. Um, it also suggests that there's a right way to tell the truth, right? That if we're too direct, it will be problematic. And she also um, suggests that we're not practiced in telling the truth. She calls the truth delightful. She calls it superb. She calls it dazzling. So it's not that truth is bad, but it's just that maybe it's too much for most people. And so instead, when she gets down where she says, as lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, instead of telling the truth directly, we often tell stories about the truth. So, you know, referring to how we explain lightning to a child. What is lightning? Well, it's, you know, a storm is God up in the heavens and he's crying and he's throwing things. And so we tell a story in order to ease children into the truth. And so the question about that is really, is that the truth, right? Is when we're giving an explanation or telling a story, are we telling the truth? Um, she also sort of suggests, you know, the idea of Plato's cave, the idea that we as humans are not really fit to handle the truth. In fact, the truth must gra dazzle gradually or every man be blind. And Plato's cave, the parable of the cave, of course, is that we, none of us can really access the real truth. We're all in a cave watching just shadows. And if we were to go out and see what's really true, we would all go blind from the brightness. Um, so, I think that this view is actually reflected a lot in literature when people are toying with ideas about what is truth and what is fiction. So I'm going to start with why, do, why should we study literature to learn about this, right? I mean, there's plenty of things that teach us about truth. We could study philosophy. We could study, you know, journalism. We could study so many different things in order to learn about how to tell the difference between truth and fiction. But not only is literature the best field, because it's my field, but it is uniquely positioned to encompass many areas of study. So one of the really fun things about studying literature is you really get to study everything, right? They, there's a literary text about everything. You can read about human relationships, ideas of progress, but you can also read about like what women wore in the 18th century or, you know, duck ponds. I don't know, whatever you want to learn about, it's there in literature. Literary texts can serve as historical documents or political documents. So when you know we look 
at a literary document, we can actually tell things about what people thought and believed at the time, or, you know, even more concrete things like what they wore at the time. Um, and literary texts also ask philosophical questions all the time, both implicitly and explicitly. Who are we? What does it mean to be human? What's identity? How do we make our lives meaningful? All those questions are constantly being asked in literature. And we can see that in Emily Dickinson's poem, right? She's asking philosophical questions about what does it mean to tell the truth? And then also reading teaches us to write, to speak, and to play with language. So what makes it special is that we also get to talk about how we do these things, how we ask these questions through language, through metaphor, through playing with different ideas and concepts. So if we want to study memoir as a literary genre, we need to understand what memoir is. So these are some of the definitions and characteristics of memoir. Usually in a memoir, the narrator is a characterization of the author, and it's important to point out that it is a characterization of the author. So it's usually in first person point of view, but it is a text that is constructed, right? So the author has made choices about how to present that narrator, just like they would in a fictional story. Um, it usually focuses on a particular period of time or a series of related events, and this is something that distinguishes it from autobiography. And if you read books about, you know, what is a memoir? A lot of times this is like the main point because for a long time, these were kind of the two main first person nonfiction texts, right? You had autobiographies and those were about somebody of note, right? A politician, a famous person. And they sort of went from their birth to the present, which was usually later in their life because they had to have lived a life worth talking about, right? So it was usually not about somebody who was young, but somebody who was later in their life. And then the memoir contrasted that by being not about somebody's entire life, but about a theme in somebody's life or a particular period of intensity in someone's life. Usually it contains a combination of experience, anecdote, story, plot, and then also reflection. You're unlikely to read a memoir that is just story, right? This happened, then this happened, and then this happened. But usually a lot of it is reflection on that event and what it means to the present narrator, what happened in the past. Um, the memoir genre had a big boom in the 1990s and early 2000s. Of course, it had been around for a lot longer than that. Um, there's lots of philosophical memoirs that are very old. And then in American literary history, there were captivity and slave narratives, which would have been considered a type of memoir um, that were also very popular. So memoir has sort of always been around, but it became really popular as sort of like a New York Times bestselling genre in the 90s and 2000s and also became sort of um, news, right? So like, are these true? Are these true stories? These people have such crazy stories. Could they possibly be true? And after that boom, um, memoir has sort of shifted and moved to a genre that has a lot of stylistic flexibility now. There are a lot of different types of memoirs, memoirs in verse, so written in poetry, um, auto theory or auto fiction. So that's ways of kind of even muddying the waters further is that this is autobiography, but it's also something else too. Um, there are elements of fiction and then speculative memoir, which has elements of like the supernatural of ghosts of um, things like that as part of the story. So we can see how this genre is becoming even more blurred when it comes to asking questions about truth and fiction. So one of the things that may distinguish memoir from other types of nonfiction writing is its literariness, for lack of a better term, which would involve a focus on style and intentional storytelling, right? So when we teach people to write memoir, we teach them to think of it like they're writing fiction. Think of yourself as a character in the story. Think of the plot that you're going to go through. Think of the other characters in the story. And of course, these are real people, but they're constructed in order to be, you know, more than just the real people because you're gonna end up with a literary product. 
something that focuses on language and style and storytelling. So one of the questions at the heart of trying to figure out if we're going to consider memoir really to be nonfiction or to be truth um, is, you know, what does nonfiction mean? Does categorizing something that way mean that it's true? Is this really a dichotomy? So I put three of the things that we're really thinking about there up at the top, which is the difference between fiction and nonfiction, then the difference between truth and fiction, and then the difference between something that's true and something that's false. And those are all three different dichotomies that are all kind of at play when we're thinking about whether a text is true or not. So we can think about it as like literally true and the opposite of that would be false, right? Like someone tells a lie intentionally, but then we have truth and fiction and fiction can contain truth. We might already all think that, right? We, we've all read probably a novel or a short story or something like that that rang as true to us or contained truth. And then there's the distinction between fiction and nonfiction, which is more of a genre distinction. And it doesn't necessarily say anything about whether something is true as in factually true or not. So the question that came up for me is, can a representation of something ever be as good as the thing itself? Can we ever really represent anything? And can a single representation ever really be the truth? So I have a artwork up there. It's called One in Three Chairs. Um, it was an installation by Kosuth in 1965. And it's hard to tell from the picture, but what it is is it's a chair a real object, a chair, and it's in between a painting of a chair and the definition of a chair, the written definition of a chair. So it's asking the, the viewer to um, consider whether or not either of those representations are accurate, if it's an accurate picture of the chair. And so as a viewer, you can look at it and you can see, well, that chair is a painting of this chair and they look pretty much alike, <laughs> but I can see some differences, right? And then the definition of a chair is a thorough definition of a chair. If I tell somebody this is what a chair is, that's pretty accurate, but is it true? Is it an, a good representation of that thing? And that is what the artist is asking us to consider. And so that's something we can consider when we look at written texts as well. And the language, the definition of the chair, the symbol is always a representation of something that really happened or a real thing, right? That's what language is. It's a symbol for a thing. And um, when we look at that and ask those questions, there's not like one single answer, right? They're just really interesting questions. And this painting I got from an essay, and that essay is called Still Life with Chair by Jericho Parms. And one of the things she asks in that essay is, why do we remember certain details? What is it about them that holds us? And this quote suggests that memory tells a selective story and that we remember certain things about events and not others. And that we can ask why, why do we remember these certain things? But also the essay is kind of like this picture itself. It's a really interesting essay and it was originally um, published in a journal called The Normal School. And it kind of asks, um, the question about how we can represent an event that we don't ne necessarily know everything about. So the center of this essay is a traumatic event, something that happens to one of the narrator's friends at school, where the narrator, this friend is struck by lightning in an accident and the narrator is not there for it. But it has a really big impact on her life because um, she had been with this friend right beforehand and experienced trauma from this event, although it wasn't her trauma. So the whole essay kind of uses this idea of trying to figure out how to represent a chair to really figure out how to represent a trauma that didn't happen to you, right? And she writes around and around it, starting off with this picture of a chair that's in a wall, which is one of these details that she remembers. Why do I remember this picture of this chair that was there that, that night? Why is this chair so important to me? And so she ends up writing around that a whole bunch and kind of ends up examining what representation means and what it would mean for her to represent this event that didn't happen to her, that ultimately she has to imagine and create herself.
All right, so I put um, paper and pens. This is an interactive presentation. I put paper and pens on your tables. So I'm gonna ask everybody to do a brief writing exercise. I'm not gonna ask you to share, don't worry. Uh, it's just for you and thinking about these issues. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm probably five minutes. I'm gonna ask you to think about a scene from memory that happened to you at least five years ago. It doesn't have to be traumatic, but just something that is an event, something you remember. And there should have been at least one or two other people who you knew at the time that were present for this event. So your writing should include any details you remember. You can actually just list details if you want, and also how you felt at the time of the event. So take just like five minutes to write about an event that you remember from your point of view. So we're just going to set that to the side for the next few slides. Let it marinate for a bit. We'll come back to it. So one of the ways that people often talk about truth in memoir is to talk about emotional truth. And I put it in scare quotes there because I'm not sure I know what it means. Um, I think that we talk about emotional truth in a, being opposed to maybe literal truth or factual truth, you know, the sequence of events that actually happened in memoir, maybe instead of, you know, getting that exactly right gets the emotion of the truth right. Um, the quotes that I have up here are from an article that was published in the Huffington Post by Madeline Crum called Nothing But the Truth Question Mark on Lying and Memoir Writing. And it was sort of examining these new hybrid genres of memoir, which include stuff other than just story, right? And maybe other than just reflection as well. And what she says um, about them is that people seem to be drawn to memoir because it fills a hole in fiction. I don't know if I believe this is true, but it's one theory, right? Is that, you know, a memoir came out this year by a child star who was on a show uh, called iCarly on Nickelodeon. And it was so popular when it came out that it sold out in bookstores. I mean, this like never happens <laughs> unless it's like, you know, the new Game of Thrones book. But uh, this memoir sold, they sold out of physical copies. You know, they had to reprint it right away. So there seems to be some hunger for this type of writing. And um, one of the things Crum says is that true or fiction seems to be, be like moving more into its own genre. Like it's really fictional. Like it has more fantasy elements, more science fiction elements, more things that are moving away from the tradition of realism and literature. And so she says, so tasked with filling the big shoes of realistic fiction, writers before them, the best memoirists imbue their stories with the particular kind of honesty novelists strive for, not factual honesty, per se, but emotional honesty. So, you know, we could say that about fiction as well, that it contains emotional truth, right? And she quotes in this piece, Mary Carr, who is a famous memoirist who wrote a memoir, her most famous memoir is called The Liars Club, which, um, and then she later wrote a book about the art of writing memoir, and she is a memoir teacher herself. She said, Truth may have become a foggy, fuzzy nether area, but untruth is simple, making up events with the intention to deceive. Even in this day of the Photoshop Facebook pic, that's not so morally hard to gauge. You know the difference between a vague memory and a clear one, and the vague ones either get left out or labeled dubious. And when I read that, I thought, but do they? <laughs> Um, do we always label our dubious memories or our vague memories as dubious? Do we always not include them as part of the story? Are or are vague memories important? Do they also possibly contain emotional truth? And, you know, the question that that leads to is kind of whether or not we can remember the emotion of an event without remembering exactly what happened in that event. And I think for most of us, the answer is yes. I can remember how I felt when I did that, but I don't really necessarily remember what happened. And that's true, not just with traumatic memories, but also with happy ones. Maybe one more very young childhood memories, thinking about, I always loved going to the fair. I remember how it made me feel, but do I remember what happened when I went to the fair when I was five? No. Can I construct it pretty accurately? Yes. Is that fiction? I don't know. I really did go to the fair, right? So 
<clears throat> emotional truth is one criteria that we can use to look at if something is true, but maybe not the only one. And so a big question came up with this with one of you know the most famous controversies in memoir, which was James Frey's book, A Million Little Pieces, which was written and published in 2003 and selected for Oprah's book club. And just made this huge astronomical hit, just like anything that's selected for Oprah's Book Club is, right? And A Million Little Pieces was an addiction memoir that talked about James Frey's addiction and recovery. Um, and after it came out, got all this attention, sold a billion copies, the Smoking Gun magazine published an article that was called A Million Little Lies, which pointed out that some of it was just factually not true, right? For example, he said he spent months in jail, and in fact, he only spent like several hours in jail. So, I mean, there were real, you know, factual lies, and like what Mary Carr says here, you know the difference between the truth and an untruth making up events with the intention to deceive, right? But James Frey, you know, went on the media circuit after this all came out and Oprah was very upset, you know, and he um, told Larry King that he stands by the book as the essential truth of my life. And then his publisher, and this was reported in Slate, gave a statement saying, recent accusations against Frey notwithstanding, the power of the overall reading experience is such that the book remains a deeply inspiring and redemptive story for millions of readers, right? So, you know, I read this book when it came out and I also found it very powerful, right? To contain very powerful truth about the experience of addiction, about the experience of feeling out of control of one's life. Um, many readers agree that he provides an emotionally resonant picture of addiction that contains truth that resonates with their experience of the same thing, right? Even if the details are not true or they're fictional. And so my question is, what does that mean? Why didn't he just call it fiction? Can it contain that same emotionally resonant truth if it's fiction? Or does that label, does labeling it as fictional somehow take away from that power? So here's something that is labeled fiction and is very powerful. So um, this is another very powerful, emotionally resonant story about Tim O'Brien's experience in the Vietnam War. Um, and this is from his book, The Things They Carried, which is a collection of interlinked short stories. And I'm focusing on this particular one called How to Tell a True War Story. So this book is intentionally categorized as fiction. If we were categorizing it today where we have more flexible genres, we might call it auto fiction or autobiographical fiction, but he published it as fiction. And the very first line of the story is, this is true. So it sets up a similar paradox to what I was talking about at the beginning of um, Emily Dickinson, right? Which is, you just told me this was fiction and now you're telling me it is true. What are you telling me? Right? And it's also asking the reader to participate in defining what it means for something to be true from that very first sentence. right? And these are a couple of quotes from the story. And what he does in the story is he tells actual war stories of things that happened to him um, in the Vietnam War. And then he also intersperses this type of reflection. It's very much like memoir writing because that's what memoir does. right? In many cases, a true war story cannot be believed. If you believe it, be skeptical. It's a question of credibility. Often the crazy stuff is true and the normal stuff isn't because the normal stuff is necessary to make you believe the truly incredible craziness, right? So then it's introducing this new concept of believability to whether something is true or not. And how do we make something that's maybe not super believable read like truth? Um, and then at the end of the story, he says, and in the end, of course, a true war story is never about war. It's about sunlight. It's about the special way that dawn spread out on a river when you know you must cross the river and march into the mountains and do things you were afraid to do. It's about love and memory. It's about sorrow. It's about a sister who never writes back and people who never listen. And so this isn't only a beautiful passage, but it is also about how memory works, right? how the details of a story are maybe as important as the narrative of the story itself, and how maybe those things that, that stand out in our memory are also important, as well as just the war story itself, which he does also tell. 
And so the question is, why? what makes this fiction and something else true that's written just like it, right? And, you know, the question is, if he made up the names, is it true? If he made up the places, is it still true? Um, if he's just an imagined storyteller, is it true? I used to teach this every semester, and my students were just like desperate to verify the truth of these stories. I mean, that's our human impulse, right, is to like go and research and say, oh, but Tim O'Brien was in the Vietnam War, and that makes it true. Um, and just to verify those details, when really what I wanted them to get at is this, right, is that it's about the process of understanding the truth or of telling the truth. So these next quotes are about that. They're about, you know, the process of telling the truth and that maybe that's what's true about memoir, right, is that it tells the true process of what it means to try to remember and tell the truth. And so these are some quotes all about giving birth and experience that many people have had, many people can relate to each other on, and many people don't really remember, right, the details of. So the first part's from a published chapter in my memoir. Um, Trying to remember the way you hurt is like sticking my hands in a bathtub full of slippery black eels. When I reach in to feel the memories, they slip and dance over and between my fingers. When I try to grab one, it stays only a moment, like an electric shock, and then another slithers past. Maggie Nelson from her hybrid memoir, people say women forget about the pain of labor due to some kind of God-given amnesia that keeps the species reproducing, but that isn't quite right. After all, what does it mean for pain to be memorable? You're either in pain or you're not, and it isn't the pain that one forgets, it's the touching death part. The experience of giving birth itself is ancient, even with all the lights and the machines and the nurses buzzing in and out. I'm an animal, a fox in a den, the very first woman birthing the very first baby. It smells of the earth, of the sea, of the essence of our bones and marrow, the insides of our veins. I see the brightness of my pain in front of my eyes like a million shining stars, like the whole universe imploding. To give birth is to touch death ever so gently, to come right to its edge and peer into it, to lose the edges of one's body, to blur with the divine. And then Julia Kristeva, who is a philosopher, not a, <laughs> not a memoirist, one does not give birth in pain, one gives birth to pain, the child represents it and henceforth it settles in, it is continuous. Obviously, you may close your eyes, cover up your ears, teach courses, run errands, tidy up the house, think about objects, subjects, but a mother is always branded by pain, she yields to it. So Kristeva and Nelson are both characterized as auto theory, because they're doing philosophy at the same time they're talking about their own experiences. And they both, um, in their writings, so in Stavat Mater, Kristeva writes about her own experience of childbirth alongside some philosophizing that she's doing about the Virgin Mary. And they're kind of set up right next to each other. And then Maggie Nelson and the Argonauts in the part the whole thing is just her voice. But then in the part where she talks about giving birth, she also includes the perspective of her partner and um, her partner's experience of that. And she lays them down next to each other in order to get at maybe a better truth about what is happening in those moments that are hard to remember. So... And then I'll talk, those are my, the other two are my passages and I'll talk about them a little more in just an upcoming slide, but get your paper back. Let's try to stop breathing in my mic. So writing break part two, underneath what you wrote, now you're gonna take not seven minutes and this will probably be even shorter than the last one, but you're gonna write the same scene, but from the perspective of another character who was there. So do your best to write what you think that other person would have experienced and felt in that same scene. So we're really gonna take just maybe like three or four minutes. So, I mean, some questions doing that activity, which I like to do, um, that come up for me is, did I just write fiction? Am I still writing memoir or am I writing fiction now? Now I'm putting it in the other person's point of view, but one of the challenges writing memoir is that you do in fact have to think about what other people thought and how they reacted and um, what they were doing in particular places and at particular times. Um, and then I have to think about what's the difference between the characters that I just wrote 
one of them I know the interiority of. And of course, there are things that make that different for the second character. Is it your sister? And she told you how she felt. She's told you a million times her story of that day. And you're kind of recounting her story. Or is it somebody who you knew 10 years ago and you don't know anymore and you never really even talked to them about that day? Those are different. And then, of course, the challenge for all memoirists, which is, would there be any way to make the second piece as true as the first? Is one more true than the other? And so Tara Westover is educated is kind of an interesting example to look at thinking about those questions. And this was our writer's read book a year ago. Um, I think it's a really unique memoir because Tara Westover isn't a writer. I mean, she is now, but when she started writing this memoir, she was a historian. And so she seems to have some of the impulses to want to make things seem true, right? It's very important for her to tell the whole story in her memoir. And there's been a lot of controversy about this memoir and the veracity of her claims of the, of the things that happened to her in her childhood. So again, she wrote it as if she was anticipating those claims, but then those claims did come, right? Um, these first quotations are from chapter 14, which is kind of a central chapter to the, the book because something happens to her brother. He has a serious accident that causes him to have a traumatic brain injury. And the effect on her brother is that he becomes abusive towards her. So although this is not her trauma that is happening here, it has a major effect on her life. And so she's trying her hardest to tell the story again of something that did not happen to her. And all of these quotes are from that. And you can hear some of the kind of language that she uses in order to make it true, even though she wasn't there, right? The story of how Sean fell would come to me in bits and pieces, thin lines of narrative from Luke and Benjamin who were there. It was a frigid afternoon and the wind was fierce, whipping the fine dust up in soft clouds. Sean was standing on a wooden pallet 20 feet in the air. 12 feet below him was a half finished concrete wall with rebar jutting outward like blunt skewers. It doesn't, I don't know, I don't know, sorry, for certain what Sean was doing on the pallet, but he was probably fitting posts or welding because that was the kind of work he did. So you can see she's trying to bring the scene to life with this descriptive language, but at the same time is saying probably, maybe, I don't know, I wasn't there. This is what they told me. I've heard conflicting accounts of why Sean fell, right? Trying to include multiple perspectives. My account of Sean's fall is based on the story as it was told to me at the time. So she's really hedging, right? She's putting this story she's telling in a particular time and place and as secondary information. This is how the fall was described to me, but my mind sketches it differently on a white page with evenly lined spaces or evenly spaced lines. So she knows it as the stories she's written of it. Um, the facts after this point are even more hazy, right? No one has ever described to me what happened when Sean's head struck that second time, whether he had a seizure or vomited or lost consciousness, I'm not sure. So she's writing into those blank spaces also. This, these are some things that might have happened. I struggled to imagine the scene while they waited for the chopper. So again, she can't even write into this scene, right? She can't imagine it. So she invites us to consider how she is constructing this scene, how she's giving multiple accounts um, and indicating what she doesn't know, right? So this goes back to a previous slide where I talked about maybe memoir. The truth of it is about how we reconstruct the truth. So another scene, which are the ones that I have on the table, and I'm not gonna read you like these packets, but <laughs> we're running out of time. But the... This scene is a scene of another one of her brothers having an injury, lots of injuries in this book. Um, they worked in a uh, scrapyard. And so there, there were a lot of times that her and her brothers were getting injured or hurt while they were working with their father. And this one, she wasn't present for the actual injury, but she was there in the aftermath. In fact, she was the only person that was there in the aftermath besides her injured brother, Luke. And um, she's 10 years old at the time. And she tells us that right at the beginning. Um, and so she, we're invited to question the veracity of a story told by a 10 year old, right? We're invited to start asking questions about the credibility of the narrator. So there's two packets on your on the desk, and one of them is this chapter from Tara Westover, which if you haven't read the book, you're welcome to, you know, take and read this chapter. But um, she starts her account on page 69 of this injury, 
And she starts with her own experience. She said, I'd stacked the dirty dishes and was filling the kitchen sink when I heard it. A shrill strangled cry that began in one key and ended in another. There was no question it was human. I'd never heard an animal bellow like that with such fluctuations in tone and pitch. I ran outside and saw Luke hobbling across the grass. He screamed for mother, then collapsed. That's when I saw the jeans on his left leg were gone, melted away. Parts of the leg were livid, red and bloody. Others were bleached and dead. Papery ropes of skin wrapped delicately around his thigh and down his calf, like wax dripping from a cheap candle. His eyes rolled back in his head. And then she goes through how she reacts, right? This 10-year-old and what she does to try to treat her brother's burned leg. Um, and it's incredibly vivid, right? You can see the vividness of her description. You can see his burned leg. So she wrote that in her memoir. And then her mother, Lori Westover, her parents disputed a lot of the claims made in this memoir, wrote her own memoir several years later called Educating. And she wrote this same scene in one of her chapters. And that's the other handout. Now, Lori Westover was not there at the time and she admits that she wasn't there she came back later and then helped treat Luke's leg she was a naturopathic sort of healer and um, Tara uses a lot of her mother's techniques when she's treating her brother's leg but her mother comes back and then tells her own story of it and as you can see if you read this it was very um, it's very much more straightforward she tells about, you know, fire is always a concern during the dry summer months in our area. There's a lot of like explanation of the scene. Luke's burning pant leg had also ignited a brush fire in the salvage yard. Val ignored the fire, put Luke in the truck and headed to the house. With a bad burn like this, residual heat continues to damage muscles and flesh even after the fire has been put out. Luke needed to be placed in cold water immediately to halt further damage. Even just from reading a paragraph, you can tell the difference in tone and those two pieces of writing, right? Um, and it's all been reconstructed from memories from other people. So then we get, you know, whose account is true? Whose account is more reliable? These are both claiming to be nonfiction, both you know, claiming to be truth. And then what factors do we use to determine reliability? These are all really important questions that Westover Style actually invites us to examine because she's inviting, as a historian, us to examine the facts. She uses footnotes. She uses other people's points of view. And then at the end, she kind of comes to the conclusion that the part we would remember would tell and retell so many times that it became family folklore was that Luke was unable to get out of his gasoline soaked jeans, right? This huge traumatic thing. And they all tell the story over and over again about his pants being stuck to his legs, right? And the idea of folklore, the idea of a family folklore is a story you tell over and over again so many times that the story version becomes the true version, right? And that asks, you know, how do we actually create memories? Can stories become memories? I'm going to briefly go over this, but in traumatic incidents, like the one that Tara Westover is telling us, memory is actually affected by trauma, right? And there's lots of research on this. This is not my area of specialty because I'm a literature scholar. Um, but trauma, if you look at, you know, this website that's in my presentation, it talks about how memory is affected by trauma. Episodic memory is affected by trauma in that we kind of lose track of what order things happen in um, during traumatic events. And that can make stories less linear, less this thing happened than this thing than this thing. And it also affects semantic memory, which is our memory that narrativizes for us, right, that turns it into a story. So what it doesn't, what it makes even stronger is our, um, our implicit memory. So long-term emotional memories, the facts that we do remember the emotions of it. And sometimes even if you read Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score, you know, and even store those in our body, creating body issues, you know, pain, tension, and um, that then we can also experience PTSD or things that trigger those memories, sounds, things in the environment. So our memory is functioning differently after a traumatic event. So then I was introduced to this book like right before this talk. So I haven't read the whole thing yet, but one of the, it's a, it's a philosophy book about memoir. And one of the questions that it asks is, is all memoir fiction? 
So it also asks other important things like what responsibility do we have to other people that we are portraying in our writing other than ourselves. But the idea that memoir can be truth actually relies on a lot of other philosophical assumptions, like the existence of a self, the existence of a world with objects that are exterior to the self. Um, and there's lots of reasons to believe that some of these are kind of faulty mechanisms. So she says, one of her quotes is, we can't hope to use our minds as an interpretation-free mirror or present our memoir as offering a fully neutral view from nowhere. Instead, what we should be after is a well-grounded, unbiased interpretation of our experience. So Debress here is, in fact, she believes that memoir can be true. It's just not necessarily truth in the way we want it to be true, right? Which is this objective portrayal of an event that really happened. And she also seems to claim that there's value in the process of just even thinking about whether or not these things are true. She says, all of these are examples where attention to the boundary between fiction and nonfiction rather than artificially simplifying matters adds valuable complexity to our reading. And I would argue valuable complexity to the writing, right? Is that it then becomes about considering these issues rather than just being about what happened. And if we in fact just focus on what happened instead of on how we remembered what happened and what comes up when we remembered what happened and how our memory works, then in fact, we're kind of doing a disservice um, to our reader. So it's my last slide. If you were thinking that I was going to come to a conclusion, you're sadly wrong. But um, so I, the reason that I like this topic and that I want to consider this topic is that I think that reading and assigning memoir as part of like a literature curriculum is really valuable. And it's because we get to talk about all these things and ask all these questions. And what we learn through doing that is a process of, you know, attempting a definition of these really complicated concepts like truth and fiction or nonfiction and fiction or true and false, um, which are such important things for us to talk about and think about and know in our culture and society today where we're confronted with so much information all the time that we have to be thinking about its credibility, its reliability, its believability, and also its truth. Um, so it's more about those discussions than it is about saying, you know, all memoir is true or all memoir is fiction, or even if a particular memoir or piece of writing is truth or fiction. So my three little takeaways here are that from reading memoir and asking questions about reliability of a single narrative, we can learn to question claims of truth, especially when they're based on someone's subjective experience. And then we can also learn to assert criteria for determining that truth. We can also recognize our own human attraction to story, to telling things like they're a story, like they have a plot. We can learn to question the veracity of our own stories and memories. And we can examine our desires to make meaning, which sometimes come, um, come up against truth, right? Our desire for an experience to be meaningful can come up against our desire for it to be true or accurately told. And then last of all, literary studies is depoliticized to an extent. It's difficult to ask questions about the truth of an experience in particular and especially political contexts. And being able to ask questions about what makes something true in the context of literary studies, I think is something that's valuable to society in general. And it gives us room to find areas of shared assumption and understanding where we might not if we were talking about something that feels more politicized. So that's my talk. Questions? Thank you. Can you go back to the second to the last slide with Helena de Grez, Artful Truce? And, yeah. Um, her statement that we should seek or strive for a well-grounded, unbiased interpretation of our experience. I guess um, when I'm reading a memoir, I'm very much expecting and hoping for the biased interpretation. It seems to me like it's work, the work of the reader to um, try to discern between the biased and the unbiased. Yeah, I think that? that's a really important point. <laughs> I think that um, Tara Westover in her book, 
really tries to provide an unbiased point of view. And when I read it, I'm not sure if it helps or harms, right? Because her version is so compelling. It's so compelling to read about what a 10 year old experienced in this particular situation. And for the reader then to decide, you know, oh, well, she's 10 and some of this might not be entirely true, but it's still so valuable as hearing her experience. So I agree with that. And I, you know, this is a very complicated philosophical argument and I'm not a philosopher, so I tried to like distill out the quotes that fit what I was talking about. But um, yeah, I, she asks really that we kind of question our ideas of self and like our self is a coherent, um, you know, whole that moves through our lives as one person and then sort of tries to present that we our understanding of that in the writing itself, I think is more what she's asking. But like you, I'm not sure I agree. <laughs>